welcome to this episode of History Makers and uh, on this episode we are lucky to have one of my old friends, a guy I've known for some time since he came from the UK and now he's in Nairobi. He played in the English game and for Harambe Stars, Karibu Sana uh, Taiwo Otieno. Karibu Sema. <laughs> he doesn't know Kiswahili but he's okay. <laughs> how, how, do, you, do you speak a bit of Kiswahili by now? speak a little bit, yeah. say Sema most of the time, Buana. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, most of the greetings. But so how did you integrate from UK to Harambe Stars? How did you... I mean, most Quite, of it was easier than, yeah. I, than I expected. Yeah. Um, most of the players were speaking English. Yeah. And the ones that didn't, I think, mm. you know, football is a language that mm. people... I guess when you're playing the game, it's a language because you're, you're communicating through body movement, through mm. eyes. Yeah. So you don't always have to speak to know what a player is going to do on the ball. Yeah. So I, yeah, I found it easy to integrate. And the, you know, Mariga, mm. Dennis, mm. Uh, Victor, they embraced me. Yeah. They're like my brothers. Mm. So you know, yeah, I found I found a lot of friends in the national team. Uh, so, what would you say is was your take home from the, uh, when you went for Harambe to play for Harambe Stars from UK? Yeah. You are playing in UK, you played for UK all your career. And then you, here you are, you're playing for Harambe Stars. And you had a small, uh, a brief stint in America? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, when I was playing for Harambe Stars, yeah. the, first, <coughs> the first stint, I was already in America. Yeah. So I think the difficulty from traveling, I think this is why Victor maybe has retired now, is because mm. when you're playing in America, it's eight hours behind. Yeah. So the jet lag will take you about two weeks to get over. And if you're coming for a national team game, you only have five days to prepare. To prepare, yes. And also, you know, yeah. it's difficult because the, the, the distance, the jet lag, and then the altitude. Yeah. Coming to play in Kenya, you're 1,400 meters above, above sea, sea level. level. yeah. Whereas in England and America, mostly, yeah. you're less than 500. So, so you are based in Kenya now? I work in Kenya, mm -hmm. but I still live in London. <laughs> what do you... What do you mean you work in Kenya and you live in London? <laughs> I'm a resident in London, but I work in Kenya. So we have companies here in Kenya. I come in, I work, and mm. obviously I manage and administer. Mm. But then I go back to England maybe mm. once a month. Once a month? Yeah. So your projects, what are you doing in Migori? So we've invested in um, about five companies in Kenya which have exploration and processing permits. Um, exploration and geology is a, for me is, is an interesting industry because you're, you're not only proving minerals but you're proving what those minerals can be used for um, and then you're also going into the production of those minerals. Um, in, you know, much like the football industry, the mining industry is very informal um, and it needs corporate governance and it needs a proper management team to make sure that whatever you're starting is going to be economical feasible but then you know once you've once you've um, established a deposit that can be economical you've then got to invest in the machinery and the team to make it work and that obviously requires a bit of expertise so i manage all of that and coordinate all of that what are you guys mining in kenya or we are not mining, we, we're doing exploration, exploration and we finished the exploration and then now we're doing um, the metallurgy work mm. which is sending samples to the lab mm. and then the lab gives us a flow chart mm. and that flow chart gives us basically um, what type of machinery we should use, mm. what kind of um, processes mm. and with that we put it in a financial model and then we see mm. how much everything will cost and then whether it's worth even doing. Mm. Um, with the project we're doing in Mugori, we've done a financial model and it's worth doing. Um, so, for me, that's, that's primarily why I wanted to get into mining, is so I could do the football. <laughs> in England, our, our football clubs were basically invested into by steel magnets, manufacturing magnets, mm -hmm. mining magnets, yeah. um, British Petroleum, you know, British yeah. Gas. Yeah. So for me, I've always wanted to have my own football club mm. here in Kenya. Mm. So it was about, let's look at how we can invest from a phase of in minerals, get the natural resources organized so that we can 
also invest in the human resources, which is football, football. social enterprise. Um, so that's, that, that, that was the basis upon which, and also my dad left me land which had minerals on it. So I have land in Magori, Kasumu and Siaya. Oh, interesting. So what, what minerals are you, uh, when you're exploring, what kind of minerals are you exploring down there? So at the moment we're exploring precious and non-precious metals, which includes obviously gold, oh. silver, copper, yeah. uh, cobalt, oh. zinc. Yeah. So, you know, we, when, you're, when you're looking for minerals, a lot of people think, oh, gold is just sitting in the ground. It's not. It's, yes. it's a very scientific process which requires you to establish what the grade is, yes. what the recovery rate is, yes. um, and then what is the process in which to the get it to the to final um, uh, metal. And, and that's a long process. It's a very expensive. There's a lot of risk attached to it. Yeah. So we work with geologists. We work with metallurgists. Um, and we follow each step um, precisely to make sure that when we go to the next step, yeah. it's worth our time and money. Otherwise, you'd be throwing money into the drain. So uh, you're just you're just doing exploration in the land, your own land, or no, no, no. So the exploration, we our licenses um, cover a, a huge amount of land, yeah. um, and if you're going to do exploration on land that is owned by others. Yeah. You have to obviously engage with the owner, explain to them what you're doing, bring them on board the, the concept. Um, obviously, the license gives you the lawful right to do exploration, but obviously they also have rights that you must, you know, consider and, and make sure we have a mutual agreement. So, so, how did you transition from you playing football to mining? To mining, <laughs> how did you transition? I didn't. Um, I was actually when I stopped playing football, I went into law. Yeah. So I, I started um, assisting friends of mine who were in the music industry, mm. football industry. Where, in London or here? In London and America. Yeah. So I've always been accustomed to contract law because yes. I signed my own contracts at football clubs. Yeah. So when I stopped playing football, mm. I was already assisting people with reading their contracts mm. and looking at how those contracts should be enforced how or amended or, or audited. More mm. often than not, it was auditing. Yeah. So, you know, we would audit um, some of these record labels in the UK, yeah. publishing companies. Yeah. Um, and when you audit people, typically you find discrepancies, you find under accounting, you mm. find other things that lead to other action, legal action. So, a lot of what I was doing when I stopped playing football was yeah. learning company law, insolvency law, contract law, tort law, common law. <laughs> and then <laughs> at the same time, I was coming back to Kenya. Yeah. And Kenya has many laws that have been enacted in the last 10 years, which yes. are quite similar to the UK. The Companies Act 2015, mm. Insolvency Act 2015, and um, the Kenya Constitution, which I was familiar with, mm. having obviously got my dual citizenship. Mm. Um, so yeah, my, and I always tell people, investment is required to build business, small, medium-sized business. But you must understand the law of business and the business of law to be successful in that arena. And it's very, it's high risk. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's very Most people will come out of school and get a job. Um, I came out of football and incorporated my own company and employed myself essentially. Um, I raised private equity investment. From private and institutional investors, mm. and they get shares in return for their, in their investment. So, yeah, it's not it's not usual. Not many footballers come from the playing riches, to riches to rags actually, yeah, not rags to riches. Yeah, um, but I've always been someone that likes to challenge myself and mm. likes to learn and listen um, and improve. So it was it was natural progression for me. So the progression was, you, you, had you planned all this before when you're playing? No, so I think... Or was it a uh, gut feeling that I want to retire from active football and I don't want to get into management, I want to get into business? I got bored of sometimes being told what to do. Yeah. And I think, I think when you start playing football, you're young, yeah, you're team, hungry. Yeah. yeah. You want to win, yeah. you want to compete, yes. and you want to get to the top yeah, yeah. of the pyramid. Yeah? Yeah. Um, you get to a certain age, I think, um, 
where you either continue thinking that way yeah. or you have other interests yeah. and your mind is stimulated by it's something else. Something else yeah. And me, I'm, I'm someone who has always been curious about law, companies, yeah. football clubs for me have always been my passion. Like, how did they build this football club? Yes. You have to go to history. Yeah. So, you know, I, I love reading history. So I'd be looking at history and then saying, oh, okay, so most football clubs were founded by people in mining, yeah, people in companies. manufacturing. Um, so if that's how they made their money to build that football club, then maybe I should look at how I could get involved in that industry yeah, or investing it. But it's also, it's also about thinking about, you know, look, I'm a, I call myself a social capitalist. Yeah. I want to build wealth so that we can create more social cohesion. Mm. Football is a sport, it's a sport that is unlike any other. It's more like a religion. Uh, Europe has cultivated football in a way in which got rid of wars. Europe was in wars for 2,000 years. Mm. Brought football in, and now instead of shooting each other, they're competing they each other, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? And that's why you have so much um, passion England lost to Italy, yes. and it felt like we had lost the war. <laughs> so, so, you know, me, I want to bring the game I love. I love football. I'd do anything for it. For my whole life, everything has come second to football. So I want to bring that love and devotion to implementing the same corporate structures, the same um, processes and, and policies here so that we can get these young people mm. nurtured, developed, and realizing their talents in sports. So how did you find your father's roots to Migori? My, and have you built so, a Simba there already? <laughs> <laughs> so my father's from Siaya, Elego yes. Kagelo. Yes. Um, but when I first came to Kenya, I was 10 in 1995. Yes. And we came to Nairobi to take my grandmother and my cousins out of Kibera slums. Yes. So I was 10, we came there. Mm. They didn't want to leave. You didn't want to leave? They did not want to leave Kibera slums. Yes, yeah. So my father was spending hours convincing them he had bought, he had bought land in Megori, yeah. and built a house, convincing them to come out of the slums. Yeah. And I was there like probably as the carrot. They, he was saying, you know, your grandson has come all the way from England to yes, see you. Yes, yes. We bought land, yes. we built a house. Yeah. You must leave these slums. Yeah? <laughs> yes. But they didn't want to leave. So after about I think two hours, they eventually came yeah. and we drove to Megori. Yeah. Um, and my dad had, um, had built a house there. Mm. Um, I spent my first Christmas there playing football in the garden. Yeah. And um, my grandma, my dad bought a chicken for me to play with. <laughs> yeah. And my grandma chopped its head off. <laughs> and I was devastated. Yeah. But we had it for a Christmas dinner. Yeah. And then after Christmas, we traveled to Kasumu. Yeah. Then and, back then, to and then to Sia, yeah. where I met my great grandmother at the time, she was 95, yeah. where our ancestral land is. So, you know, I, when I came to Kenya as a young boy, I, I fell in love with the place. Mm -hmm. And I always knew, it always stuck with me as a kid, yeah. that I need to come back to this place. Um, and when I signed my first professional contract, I was 15. Mm. My mum passed away, mm. uh, so I was, I was technically an orphan. Um, and I just, I was, Discipline. I say, I'm going to make this football thing work. I'm going to become um, a, uh, a player in England, mm. and I want to come back and play for Kenya. Mm. Unfortunately, Kenya was banned by FIFA mm. in 2004 yeah. or five. Yeah. So I wasn't able to play. And then six, seven, we had election violence. Mm. And then eight, I started speaking with the FKF. I mean, Kenya Football Federation again. Mm. And then in 2009, that's when I came. Yeah. So in about a four or five year period, mm -hmm. so many things happened that didn't really allow me to come and play. But, but you, I eventually got here. You, did you enjoy playing for Harambe Stars? Yeah, I loved it. Uh, training, I did mostly training. Uh, whenever there was a game, um, I came off the bench a couple of times mm -hmm. in the qualifiers in 2010. <clears throat> and I enjoyed it, you know, I made a lot of friends in the national team. Um, I'm still friends, uh, you know, with the likes of Mariga, Dennis and, and Wanyama. So they're like my brothers, so Did yeah, you, I loved you, it. You met Wanyama in the UK when you are there? Yeah, I've been to Wanyama's, I, I met Wanyama when he was at 
Celtic, Celtic yeah. Southampton, Tottenham. <laughs> I've gone to watch him play many times. You know, yeah. Victor's like my brother. I've known him since he's 17. Yeah. He's yeah. like my brother. And his brothers and sisters, Mercy, yeah. Baba, yeah. Um, Heskey, yeah, Heskey um, yeah. their mother, Mama Wanyama, yeah. and father, Mama Wanyama. You know, these are like my family. So yeah. for the past 12 years, you know, we've been very close. Um, and we always talk about, you know, what we can do to get to football do. here better, yeah. organized, how we can invest, how we can get the youth developed get them playing, get Kenya into the World Cup. That's my dream, ultimately. When, before I'm 50, I want to see Kenya in the World <laughs> Cup. So, t did you, have you already gotten um, a Kenyan wife? A Kenyan wife? Yeah. Uh, I'm not married. Aye, there are very many beautiful <laughs> Kenyan girls in this city. Yeah, Kenya has very beautiful women. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm an introvert and I'm also a workaholic, so... Aye. I've not really um, been or able you want to, 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 to establish a relationship with a woman mm. um, because my work takes more priority. And, you know, look, I think I don't really go out looking for a relationship with a woman. If it happens, <laughs> it happens. You know, I obviously want to have a family and kids one day. Yeah. Um, but my main priority at the moment is um, structuring and rebuilding um, investments around social enterprise, football clubs. And, 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 you know, for me, there's so many young people in Western, Central, um, and, and the coast of Kenya that want to be athletes, that want to have the opportunity to be athletes. Mm. And my role as someone, you know, Kenya gave me life. My father came from Siaya. Mm to England because he loved Gorma here. He wanted to see the English football. <laughs> and had it not been for that, that drive, yes. I wouldn't be sat here with you today. So Have you been to Gorma here much? Of course. Of course I've been to Gorma here against AFC. <laughs> <laughs> so um, naturally you support Gorma here now? Yeah, Gorma here is my, my team. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I want to give back as much as I can to Kenya. When I'm an old man, you know, I want to look back and say, what, what did I contribute towards others' success? Yeah. And that, that's really my priority at the moment. And if I meet, if I meet a, a woman who, you know, <laughs> sees and believes in that same vision, then I guess it's, it's meant to be. We hope that you're going to get one very soon in Nairobi. Nairobi is a very epitomistic place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very diverse. There's a lot of people here from many countries yeah. in East Africa. But back to <coughs> your project and the football project. Mm. So how long do you think this dream will be actualized of setting an academy or a football organization or a team so from right your now, mining, the, trans the transition from mining into footballing yeah. management? I've, I've, all the stuff that I'm doing in um, our mining companies, I've, I've completed. My, I'm actually right now having a lot of discussions with football stakeholders, specifically the clubs. Mm. Um, my view is that if you can invest in the clubs, mm. they are the best um, tools to developing young talent, um, talent mm. and also getting into the community mm. and bringing about social impactful initiatives yeah. um, that for me mm. is going to be a f possibly a three to five maybe ten year Plan. project yeah. because you're developing people um, and it's not you know I, I gave Nick um, a strategic plan back in 2015 mm. I spent five thousand dollars of my own money mm. said Nick take this plan mm. and use this for youth development mm. within your um, vision and your own plan, implement some of these mm. and maybe by 2022 mm. we can qualify for the World Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're almost in 2022 and we can't even beat Mali. So if my, my, <laughs> my, my issue yeah. is that none of us mm. that are in football now mm. have implemented plans that are long term mm. and therefore that's why we're not seeing any fruits. You know, mm. the fruits, there's lots of talent in Kenya. Mm. No one can say there's no talent in Kenya. There's but Nick says there's no talent in Kenya. Nick is misinformed and I would encourage him to come out of Nairobi and look at all the primary schools mm. in Kiambu, mm. in Eldoret, um, in Yanza, mm. 
Western Kenya, look at all the primary schools and see the young people playing football, yeah? And tell me if there's no talent. But did he appreciate, did he tell you he will implement that strategic plan? <coughs> so or I was actually going to, I offered my services to FKF for free. I said, mm -hmm. I'll come on board and assist you with whatever I can for free. Mm -hmm. But I want to be a commercial director to implement these things. Mm -hmm. I think at the time he, he said to me, um, it'd be a, he had a CEO, commercial director may conflict with that position because mm -hmm. a commercial director is a, is, a, is, a, is somewhat of a CEO, but yeah. not but more broader. Mm. Um, so he offered me the position of CFO, which mm. is Chief um, Financial, Financial Officer. Officer. And I said to him, well, um, you could probably get someone who's more uh, from a, a financial, financial background. Uh, background. I, I would rather be implementing some of this policy. Mm. Um, but this was before he got elected. So he did say once he got elected that, you know, I could have a discussion with him and that. But I don't, nothing ever happened after that. Um, and I. For me, I just thought at the time, I've given you something which I hope you can use for the benefit of Kenyan football. My vision and plan for Kenyan football isn't based around the national team, yeah. it's based around the grassroots. Yeah. Getting young people through nurtured and developed yeah. through the professional football clubs. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, I think my plan and my vision would actually produce, um, through the clubs, produce more results. Like in England, for example, Man United produced more players than I think the national team do. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. So, what is the problem with Kenyan football? What do you think is the problem, the endemic problem with our Kenyan football? What do you think? It I is? think the structures. Yeah. So we need to be incorporating our football yeah. clubs as companies, yeah. not societies. Yeah. Societies can be used for amateur football. Yeah. Professional football must be for a company. Companies, yeah. Now, I, if people ask me, Ty, why, where do you come to that view? I'd say, well, companies are basically incorporated into the Kenyan Companies Act, yeah, yeah and the Registrar of Companies, which is a regulated body um, and has specific laws and rules about how you administer that company. Mm. Whereas the societies, mm. it doesn't. Well, it does, but it's not the same. Mm. Now, a company has what's called shareholders, and directors, directors yeah. and that, that um, I guess, separation of powers mm. creates more transparency, more accountability. Mm. If, if right now we're, ordering F, we're auditing FKF because of accountability, mm. it's because FKF has no members. <laughs> it just has a chairman. Yeah. And that chairman wields unlimited power. power. Yes, all power. So even if he has done something he shouldn't have done, he has the power to say, well, I decided that's how it should be done. Why um, can't then, then if that's, that's endemic and it's the, the way we formulate our football is a problem and the way our football is run is also a serious problem in leadership. Yeah. But the other question which is fundamental is how do we get more Kenyan players, for example, play in the UK or in the major leagues? We, we, we have to invest into football clubs through companies. Man United is a limited company. Yeah. The English Football Association the is a limited company. company. All 95 professional That's clubs in England is a, limited are limited companies. Company. Yeah. This isn't a coincidence. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Um, and I would encourage, if, if people in Kenya <coughs> want to answer the question as to why we're not succeeding in football, yeah. Yeah. just do some research. Uh, look at the history of football mm. in England, that's where it was invented. Look at the, the history of the game and you'll see they went through the same problems as probably <laughs> what we're going through now. Yeah. And they found solutions. Yeah. Yeah? They found solutions. Look, we, the wheel <laughs> was invented. We yeah. can't reinvent the wheel. Yes, of course. Football is a business. It's not just a sport. Yeah. And if you, if you want to build a hotel in Nairobi, yeah. they all incorporate yeah. at the registrar companies. Why? Because yeah. they need capital to buy land, to build a hotel, to pay staff, all and the things. to operate. Yeah. So <laughs> why do people think football is any different? You know, so I think we need to get real about how yeah. football can be improved. And it, it needs capital money from private investors. The government, it's not the government's job to invest in a private company. It is a private equity. It's the, 
Radisson Blue, any hotel in Nairobi has private investors put their money in, mm -hmm. take the risk, and they have the expertise to manage and run that business. If you look at the whole setup of Harambe Stars, the Kenyan teams, and lack of sponsorship, and you move into uh, this is year 2021 20, 22, we are not playing in any major tournament. How do you shake it up and reshape the We need to restructure it by incorporating it. Um, Kenya is the sixth largest economy in Africa. In Africa yes. Yeah? And East Africa is the second largest economy in Africa after Nigeria. Mm. Now, that means Kenya is the most powerful economy in the second largest economy in Africa. Mm. We have all the resources, the institutions to have a successful football um, league and football mm. clubs. Mm. The reason we don't is because we, for some reason, we're not incorporating the right vehicles, companies, to administer football. Um, and it's really that simple. I, 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 I don't want to complicate the, the, the answer because that's what I've observed. So in, in your projects, in any charity if projects you're doing in the CIA or the villages there or just commercial? Charity has a, look, charity is, it has a role in football, but not for the establishment of a professional mm -hmm. football. I also think we put too much emphasis on sponsorship here. Yeah. A sponsor, is exactly what it says on it the is, tin. Yes. It's sponsoring yeah. or endorsing. Yeah? yeah, It's not investing. It's not. It's, it's not. interest is purely, purely to have its commercial. name attached to whatever you've invested in. Yes. So Man United, for example, the Glazers invested in Man United. Yeah. But Nike or it's Adidas sponsor. is sponsoring their investment. Yeah. I.e. putting their name on. And that sponsorship is... It, it can't be relied upon to run the whole of Man United. You can't. It's just or a bit of it. If, if, I'm running, if I'm running a football club in Kenya, mm. let's say um, um, Gorma here or AFC, mm. I can't rely on Safaricom or, to do or Airtel to give me a sponsorship deal that will cover all liabilities and expenditure. You see? I see. So yeah. cash flow must be generated from multiple sources and that needs to be invested in. My former club had a hotel, mm. had uh, conference and, and banqueting, mm. had business facilities. Yeah. So they're making money from those three things, plus selling tickets, plus selling burgers on match day, <laughs> advertising, marketing, TV, right? all those things, you know, like players, shirts, you know, merchandise. So you've got five different revenue streams coming into the company. The company holds those rights, and directors enforce those rights, and the members mm. oversee the directors. Okay. So, uh, as we continue, as we almost finish, I can see your shoe is a very expensive one. It is. What are you wearing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you wearing? Uh, what am I wearing? What yes. are these? <laughs> I think, uh, I, I can't remember what they are, um, but yeah. They're, they're nice quality. I like nice shoes. Yes. I'm not a fancy person, but I do like But quality. the suit is a uh, slim fit. Yes. I like wearing suits. Um, it's, it's breathable. <laughs> um, it's Italian suit. Um, my grandfather on my mother's side was half Italian, half English. So was I half like, Italian, I like, half I like, English? Yeah. Your, your you know, grandma? My grandfather. Yeah. yeah. So I like eating pasta and I like Italian suits. So which which make it, which which label is it? Uh, Hugo Boss. Hugo Boss, and the shoe. I think they're the same. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. I haven't looked at them in a while. <laughs> How much does it cost to dress like this? Uh, you have to invest in your attire, innit? Um, without giving out numbers, I guess. I can't remember what I spent. But yeah, I invested well in my suits. <laughs> What's your favorite suit color? Blue? Um, I'd probably say um, blue, gray, my favorite colors. Black, obviously, is um, a more formal yeah. uh, suit. Um, but you know, if you, if you want to do business and you want to be, um, I know, look, in England, they've gone away from suits a little bit, but I'm still kind of like 
a traditional suit wearing person. I try and make it more casual. Yeah. But I think if you're doing business and you want to, you know, get people to take seriously, you must invest in uh, you're what you're going to wear. And, um, yeah. It's just part and parcel of, I guess, the business <laughs> environment. If you're going to play professional football, you better wear football boots, you know. <laughs> it's just, yeah, the uniform. The uniform, yeah? And that watch looks more expensive than uh, my no, suit, actually. No, 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 this is a very cheap <laughs> watch. <laughs> it's glistening. Yeah, it has some, uh, some what you're working on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But, but um, the other thing I wanted to ask, how many Luo words do you know by now? Not enough. Swahili Remember, words. I, I speak business in Yanza. You speak business. I do not speak Swahili or Luo. Yeah. I speak business. If they, if a Luo tells you Nyingi, you know what Nyingi ngano? I say pleasure to meet you. Jina <laughs> konani? Nah, I wouldn't know. You know, I, most of my directors speak Luo for me. <laughs> so if I if I don't know, or I can't. If I don't speak English, yeah. then my director speaks so to them. So your grandmother was speaking to you in the Luo, isn't it? I was 10 years old, that was like 20, 20, 21 years ago. And your father didn't speak? remember what your she was father speaking. Speak in yeah, my, grand, my father spoke six languages. Yeah. He never spoke to you in Luo whatsoever? No, no. I grew up with my mother yeah. in England. He, he was in Sweden. He couldn't get a work permit yeah. in England. Yeah. Um, so he went to Sweden. Yeah. Um, and I would visit him. I think I saw him about six times in my whole life. Um, but he always spoke English to me, and we always used to email. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Taiwo, for this uh, interview. We really appreciate. This is part of the History Makers. You're one of the Kenyan okay, History Makers, you. and we appreciate you. And uh, thank you for having me. Come, come, come all over again so that we can continue chatting. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Definitely. All right.